sci-fi and fantasy short stories. Of Risk and Relativity by Leslie Heron. Chapter 16, Having a God Time. In the icy grasp of water, a deafening symphony rang out alongside the swirling tempest of crystal spears, all of it a mournful melody that reached out with long fingers to wake her. Darkness gave way to a dimly lit expanse of nothing as Ruby pried open her eyes. Her mind was fuzzy, little more than a sluggish whirl of confusion. How was she alive? Bubbles floated up around her, escaping her nose and mouth to pull her hair away from her face. She struggled to focus on anything, but there was nothing save for the darkness. A large shard of clear glass drifted down lazily before her, sending prisms of light across her vision, illuminating the dark enough that she caught sight of her reflection in its mirrored surface. She was beaten, battered, and bruised. Her eyes continued to follow her image up the length of the crystal, and there she glimpsed a horrifying sight. Thousands of tiny, lifeless bodies cascaded down from the rippling ring of light. They fell past her, their bodies endlessly reflected off the shards of chandelier crystals that sank into the darkness, a slow parade of death. How could this be? She remembered the fight, her impact into the gaudy ceiling decor, and then... Rupi's heart skipped a beat. She had fallen into the pool below shortly after, when the entire chandelier broke free from the rafters. She clamped down on the stream of bubbles escaping her mouth to preserve what little oxygen she had left. She threw out a hand and pulled back, then another, until she was kicking hard and reaching for that rippling circle of light. But no matter how hard she kicked, or how furiously she struggled, she could get no closer. Realizing she was weighed down by her holy armor, Ruby set to the task of removing anything and everything she could. Boots, gauntlets, breastplate, and even the heavy, ruffled dress were soon drifting down into the open maw of darkness, leaving her in only her chemise and bloomers. She gave a reflexive glance down, but shook the thoughts from her head. She'd mourn the loss of her armor and battle dress later. Right now... She had to survive. Ruby returned her attention to the ring of light above her and tried again, kicking and pulling at the water. But still, she made no progress. Why do you struggle to return to the surface, little emissary? She froze at the sound of a booming voice that rocked her body on the ripples it caused. She dropped her hands and ceased her kicking to spin around in several circles, searching for the owner but only darkness greeted her every move. You are not drowning, and you are not yet dead. So I ask again, why do you struggle to return to the surface when we have not spoken? A flash of silver whizzed by her peripheral, causing Ruby to chase it with another spin of her body. She opened her mouth, instinct urging her to call out. But when a bubble of precious oxygen escaped her instead of words, she clamped her hands around her mouth. She was hallucinating, she realized. The last, final attempts of her brain to rationalize what was happening to her. And amidst the dead pixies and chandelier shards, her mind was creating a monster of the darkness. Yes, I suppose that would be an apt description of me. She jolted as she realized it had heard her thoughts. Her pounding heart could hardly muffle the sound of crunching that echoed out from the void beneath her. Ruby scanned around, still searching for the owner of that eerie, mind-reading voice, when slow understanding sank in around her. She was breathing, and not sucking down water. This sudden awareness faded to shock when something launched out of the darkness, coming to a stop right before her. A long, thin, red tendril. Well, dying at the tentacles of a kraken was not how she thought she'd meet her end, but perhaps that was just her manic brain taking in that stupid robot's last words and forming something for her to fear. Ha! 
She lashed out with her hand, attempting to swat away the thing. Good luck trying to eat me, she thought. The tentacle fell away, dissolving back into the darkness as the voice replied to her intention, not with words, but a rumbling laugh. Ruby was constructing several more colorful options when something massive emerged from the darkness. Oh, little emissary of Discola, you have found yourself a long way from what you know. Like an arrow loosed from a bow, something silver shot up from beneath her, rocketing up towards that rippling ring of light. It was the size of a skyscraper, with silver scales and a mane of red that ran along its muscular back. It remained motionless for a period, the bobbles near its head flicking out to tease the surface before it relaxed and began to sink back down into the dark. A large, glassy black eye stopped level with her, narrowing its focus to observe her. Ruby wondered if the display was meant to scare or startle, but she was neither of those things as she folded her arms around herself. Arrogance is the brand of the scholar. What brings you to my little pond? Ruby mimed the word pond with a slight shake of her head. A prison would be a more accurate description of where we are, but I find that stifling. The fish rocked with the gentle movements of the water, and the red fin along its back continued to undulate. But Ruby's focus was solely on the image of herself, reflected back to her in that titanic eye. She watched the bubbles float up toward the surface, and each curl of her hair unwind itself, before she noticed her lack of protection. How could she be so stupid? Now she had no way to fight this... God. I am no more a god than a mountain is simply a rock. She narrowed her eyes to dangerous slits. Her thoughts were as loud here as a voice. She rubbed at her throat, massaging the invisible wound she carried. She was used to not being able to communicate so easily, an act she long took for granted. But this, this was disorienting. There was a very real threat of her mind wandering to things it shouldn't. She shook her head, cleared her mental landscape, and turned her attention back to the eye. You called this a prison, she thought, careful to form each word in her mind as clearly as possible while gesturing around her with open arms. Who put you here and why? I presume you're not a tale of the two goddesses, yes? The god paused for a breath, chuckling at the absurdity of his own words. As the right hand to the seeker, of course you do. But before the war, the goddesses, or even the Scala, there were stars. That last word echoed around her, and the darkness exploded into a billion tiny pinpricks of light, causing Ruby to shield her eyes in surprise. They floated lazily around her, creating the mirage of galaxies and stars. She reached out to poke one, and it wriggled and squirmed away at her touch. The water was filled with thousands of tiny, bioluminescent lanternfish. In those days, before the sun and the moon, I ruled. I consumed what I wanted, when I wanted. I was the beginning and the end. Entire portions of the cosmos began swirling in on themselves, disappearing into pools of darkness encircled by the event horizons of dying stars. One of the goddesses made a mistake and trusted her followers with a power they should not have. The swirling cosmos shook. All of reality began to unravel. The other gods begged me to devour the fraying threads of fate, to destroy the sickness that threatened all and restore the natural order. And I did. But the gods ceased their praise when I came for the one who caused it all, to consume her as well. The water churned with the gods' apparent agitation, and the tiny glowing fish scattered in terror, 
leaving Ruby alone in the darkness. Oh, but those two goddesses thought themselves clever. They plotted a betrayal rather than accept the punishment and laid a trap. The god's eye closed for a long moment, before it flicked back open to focus on the tiny human stuck alongside him in his prison. They stole my power to forge this infinite cage, a repeating space with no beginning or end, in order to contain me. They said my hunger had grown too great. That is the name they gave me, by the way. Hunger. I'll admit, it is fitting. But it was the lie they used to convince the other gods I was best left here, with only a cruel window for me to gaze through. How do I get out of here? Ruby thought, her hand gesturing lazily to the rippling ring of light. Did you know that the power of gods can be taken? She licked her lips. Was the fish inviting her to take his power? <laughs> My, aren't you the hungry little thing? No, but I think we both want something from one another. The god swam further up, toward the surface, and its silver scales reflected the dim light, nearly camouflaging the fish entirely but the illusion was shattered near the end of its sinewy body. Where a tail of flesh should have been, there was only bone, a mangled wound that failed to claim the life of the creature. Ruby tore her eyes away from the decaying sight to glance around at the remaining glowing fish. What do you offer? she thought. A key. Hunger dropped back down along the water column, sinking quietly like a lead weight. He swiveled that massive black eye around on her, focusing intently on the tiny human. The scholar's vessel is what you seek, no? What use is finding it if you cannot enter? How did this fish know of the Great Ark? And this was the first she had heard of a key. Though the scholar had always played things close to his chest... Ruby's mind swam with questions as she continued to hold the gaze of a god. My prison was the first. A rough draft, if you will. The goddesses needed to know how to keep that vessel from greedy human hands. It is contained within the perfect cage. With only a thought, hunger rallied scores of lanternfish and willed them into a shape. The key you need is hidden away somewhere in the human world. Even though it hardly looked like any key Ruby had ever seen, she carefully took note of its shape, round and filled with blocky, hexagonal designs. It was definitely human-made. She pulled her eyes from it to gaze up at the creature and thought, What is in it for you? The scholar is in my debt already. By doing this for you, you will tell him that he may unlock my cage to repay what is owed. That is what's in it for me. The god was right in that notion that their goals aligned. Ruby wanted this just as much as the fish did. But where to start? How was she even supposed to escape this watery prison? Hunger sank down, a greedy smile shining in its enormous black eye. It sent shivers across her spine. Now that I have offered you the means to take back what you desire, answer me this, little one. What do you know of killing gods? Slapping down a sheet of fresh paper on the table next to a box, Artemis shoved his quill into the ink pot and scribbled out the words... Experiment 32C, Ambient Shade Absorption Test. He plucked up his half-eaten sandwich, one of many that littered his workspace, and took a bite from the corner, staring at his words as his mind spiraled deep into thought. Even though he had spent the last several hours poring over every inch of Eric's journal like it was a holy text— he was no closer to understanding the power that moved the half-elf through time, or how to apply it to his own work. Where did it come from? How did he manipulate this? He pressed the nib back to the paper and scribbled out the word, 
Wraith. He followed it with several question marks and circles. The rest of the book was dedicated to shade, and Artemis leaned over the journal, dipping his quill into the ink several times before he transcribed that particular line of text. Via the transfer of shade, in conjunction with guided intent, a desired transformation of forces may occur. He had read that line several times, trying to understand what it meant. Conventional wisdom said that shade did not contain the mind, rather powered the body like a well of energy. Some things could do irreparable damage to it, creating wounds or fissures, or leaving permanent scars on the soul. There was a name scrawled into the corner of the page that contained that particular phrase. Artemis wondered who Varen was and why it was important to this topic. But if Shade did not contain the mind, could they work together? Do they function separately? How did they access one another? He knew the answers were in Eric's journal. He could feel them lying between the lines like magic in a tome. <sighs> Artemis stared down at his messy page of his thoughts and copied words before his attention flickered back to the box that sat beside the papers. The hourglass next to it was nearly out of sand. He grimaced at the sight and was about to try putting his knowledge to work, reaching for the lid of the box, when... Knock, knock. He jumped as a voice on the other side of his door barely preceded the turning of the knob. He scarcely had a moment to fling several loose pages over the box before Eric walked in, not waiting for invitation or permission. Artemis forced a not-so-convincing smile on his face as he moved his hands behind his back. Uh, sorry, am I? Eric glanced around, from the guilty look on the necromancer's face to the absolute disaster he called his room and back. Interrupting something? Artemis blurted out a nervous chuckle before he managed to find his words. <laughs> uh, uh, nope, I, uh... He waved a hand down to the journal and the pages. I was just studying. He pushed the book across the table. Sorry for keeping it longer than I said I would, but, uh... Since you're here, can I ask you a question? Eric plucked up the journal and tucked it into the inside pocket of his dad's bomber jacket. As long as it's not about my terrible penmanship. He lifted his blackened fingers. Indiga's grandmother said I should keep writing to retain the feeling, but it's hard to hold anything for too long. Oh, no, <laughs> that wasn't a problem at all. Artemis chuckled a little as he shrugged, pulling his notes closer to read them. Undead handwriting is terrible. This is no worse than that. But what I wanted to know is, how do you use your shade to navigate through time? Everything here is just, I don't know, not clicking. I'm still working that out myself. It just sort of happens. Not like I can paint you a picture or describe it step by step, blow by blow. Sorry. Eric stared down at his hands before he looked up, finally posing the question that had been gnawing at him for several days. Why did you agree to join me? Why not go back home? Busy shuffling papers around and digging through past notes, Artemis froze at that word. His back was to the half-elf now, and it was a good thing, too. He was sure the lines on his face would give him away. He gathered up his scattered pages and turned, his gaze flickering back to the box on the table for a breath. I'm looking for answers. To necromancy. Eric forced a smile on his face, but he was keenly aware that it didn't feel remotely genuine. Oh, uh, is that a common profession? Back home? <laughs> no, not in hundreds of years. The scholar hunted down almost all the necromancers and stole their texts. I've been learning what I can from what I scrounge and experimentation, but it's... it's not easy going. Artemis moved his attention to the piles of clothes and wadded papers that littered the floor. That's why I agreed to go with you. I seek the gods. So why not ask Rumus for help? I uh, did. 
Wildly scratching at the back of his head, Artemis began rifling through the plates of half-eaten meals that spread out across his bed, moving them to any empty, hard surface he could find. How had his room gotten this messy in only three days? But he wasn't... helpful. Eric rubbed a hand across his mouth for a moment. I could ask Lyra if she's willing to speak with you. Thank you, but uh, no. Artemis's attention wavered on the mess before him and the box that sat on the table behind him. The hourglass was completely empty. He needed the half-elf to go, especially given his apparent distaste for necromancy, but he needed to keep in his good graces. Perhaps a gift would work, and he'd been working on just such a thing a few days prior, if he could remember where he put it. He began digging through the piles with renewed vigor. She's a terrestrial god, so she wouldn't know how to answer my questions. Terrestrial? I thought you knew. Uh, most gods are separated into two categories. Those that were once mortal, as in they didn't originate from belief, but were rather altered by it, and those that never existed in the physical world. Ethereal gods, like Rumis, exist outside our realm and have to use possession or avatars to interact with us. They have access to a greater knowledge. Eric had pulled his journal from his pocket and set it down on the table, flipping it open to a blank page. He had just grabbed a pen to transcribe the information, a grin wide across his face, the one he always wore when he was learning something new, when the violent tremors in his hand caused him to knock over the inkwell. <sighs> Crap! He rushed to gather the pages. Oh, uh, don't worry about it. Artemis put an arm out to stop the elf before he could reach the box, one hand hovering over the quickly spreading mess while the other held up what he had been searching for. I'll clean it up, uh, but uh, try these out. He shoved the prize into the other man's hands. Weighted gloves, an old necromancer trick. They should help with the tremors a bit. You should have an easier time writing. He gestured with a look down at the journal. Wow, thanks. Eric, eager to transcribe that bit about the gods into his journal, pushed his fingers into the gloves and gave them a test flex. They trembled in response, but he found it was muted and less painful. His grin only grew as he snatched up his book. I gotta give these puppies a test run. Uh, thank you, again. Artemis began ushering the half-elf towards the door, all smiles and nods and waving off the gratitude when the other man stopped in his tracks and spun around in the doorway. Oh, I almost forgot. Train leaves at half-past six tomorrow morning for... What was it called again? Can... no, uh... Kinscarp? Coonscarp. Artemis nodded once more. No problem. I can meet you on the platform. I'm going to pack now, so you can... A muffled, wet explosion cut off his words, and his face fell. When the necromancer offered no explanation, and his own mind focused elsewhere, Eric decided the sound came from a neighboring room, and he shrugged to himself. He stepped out into the hallway, turning towards his own room. Have a good night. Artemis's smile was too wide, too much teeth, but it was all he could force onto his face as he waved off the half-elf. He waited several seconds before he shut his door and rushed back to the table. The papers he had used to hide the box had scattered over the inky mess and were plastered with gore. His shoulders drooped as he stared down at the disaster contained within. He pulled over the page he'd begun scribbling on earlier. The quill was wet with spilled ink, and Artemis scrawled, Experiment 32C. Subject was left in a state of forced consumption for too long and exploded. Results inconclusive. Progress towards replicating the Wraith power supply has been stalled until new subject can be acquired. Hopefully, Coonscop God will have answers. He grumbled as he tossed the quill into the empty inkwell. 
His attention moved back to the box that contained the now-exploded remnants of an undead ferret. The experimental shunt he had stitched into its shade had gone unchecked for too long, and all data had been lost. He ground his teeth in frustration and swept the entire thing into a nearby wastebasket. How much longer must he wait? What is it? My pager said it was an emergency. Lucas rounded the corner, nearly clipping his shoulder as the door to the dire liar tavern rebounded off something on the other side. As he squeezed through, he had to blink several times to make sure he wasn't seeing double or triple. The tavern was somehow enlarged to several times its normal size, and the crowd of people was so thick he could hardly see the far walls. The extension was not the only thing different about the bar. A large paper banner stretched across the rafters, emblazoned with the words, Happy Fading Away, and balloons and streamers decorated just about every inch of the room. Golden cloths were draped across the tables and counters, and every attending god wore a black paper hat topped with multicolored strips of paper. As confused as Lucas was, he managed a chuckle at the sight of one of the animal-headed gods, a stern jackal-faced man, tooting away on a paper party horn while balancing plates of cake in all four hands. And distributed amongst the gods and other patrons, in plenty, was alcohol. Bottles, flagons, casks, and barrels were on display, and every bartender on deck to fill the endless line of mugs thrust at them. All in celebration of... what exactly? Lucas caught sight of his friend serving said drinks with smiles from behind the counter, and he approached, his hands held out in a questioning gesture. Atlas looked up as he pushed a bottle of champagne toward a dainty goddess, and the smile on his face, the one he was using to charm her, dimmed at the sight of the dryad. It's about time you showed up. I've been waiting for thirty minutes. <sighs> you know, when you page your friend with an emergency, it's usually best that there be an actual emergency. If Miranda catches you using my company pager for personal use, we're both gonna be in it. Lucas dropped his hands. This looks like a party. Why do you even need me here? He leaned across the counter, his voice moving to a whisper. I was working on a plan to get our contracts. The arcanist didn't need to know that was a lie. Only Twixel knew he was napping. Or trying to, at least. Atlas dismissed the Dryad's concerns with a wave of his hand. How many times must I tell you? Anything you come up with, I've already thought of and rejected. Trust me, I've got it handled. All we need is a distraction. And this, his hand, clamped around a glass of liquor, gestured to the tavern, is the perfect opportunity. Lucas followed the arcanist's movements to see, sitting all alone at a table in the corner of the tavern, a ghostly figure. With brown robes and tonsure haircut, the man looked exactly like an 18th century monk. His sad, gray eyes were comically enlarged by thick lenses as he stared down a glass held in both shaking hands. Over his tattered garments, he wore a black sash with golden lettering that read, Goodbye Eternity. Eh, I don't understand. What is this, and what does it have to do with the plan? Lucas's face twisted in confusion as he glanced over his shoulder. Well, you see, that over there is Friar Andrew, the patron saint of oracular hiccup interpretation. His confusion morphed into wild bewilderment, and Lucas turned back in time to see the friar attempt to drink the liquid in his cup, only to have a body-trembling hiccup splashed across his face instead. The god uttered faintly, Rain on Sunday, before setting down his now empty cup. Why would anyone need an oracle for hiccups? Lucas returned his attention to the arcanist. Nobody needs oracle interpretation anymore. That's why he's fading away, you see. Atlas tossed back the contents of his cup before reaching beneath the counter to extract a dusty green bottle and slid it toward a cloaked figure. I heard Andrew has been barely hanging on because his last living believer is over 2,000 years old and is nearing his end. 
And when the beliefs in God ceases to exist, so do they. What? Lucas looked mortified. If I stop believing in a god, I kill them. It's not as simple as that. Gods are like ideas. As long as someone believes, you can't kill them. At least not permanently, like. But that's a whole different kind of worms. Oh, like Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy. Nodding, Atlas pointed to a table near the back where a pixie-sized woman dressed in a white ballerina gown was dancing on the table to uproarious applause. Yeah, they've got nice personalities, but they're horrible kissers. Several other fairies joined in the festive display. It's all about teeth with them. Hard to enjoy the moment when suddenly there are hands in your mouth. He sniffed pointedly for a moment before losing himself to his thoughts. Lucas snapped his fingers several times. Oi, focus! Right, the plan. Well, you see, the hotel manager is supposed to come and sign off on any god's official departure. Personally. He waited for a breath, hoping for more explanation, but when the arcanist returned to pouring drinks, Lucas tossed his hands in the air. And? And what? She'll be up here, which means you can go down there and rifle through her office. Lucas drew the attention of the nearby gods when he barked a laugh so loud it startled them into silence. <laughs> rifle through her office? Have you lost your mind? What? Atlas shrugged. She likes you. More than the three of us, at least. He didn't want to admit it, but the arcanist was right. Lucas had noticed a slight, imperceptible even, change in the Gorgon's behavior whenever she spoke to him. He rubbed at his forehead with a long groan. Yeah, it's a stupid idea, but I'll do it. He slid off the stool and leveled a finger at his friend. But you better have a plan B ready for when I get back. He narrowed his eyes. Plan B for because it didn't work. Honestly, flirting with a Gorgon. Flirt? What? <laughs> I never told you to do any of that. Atlas grabbed the dryad and pulled him back, leaning in close. She's already proven impervious to manly charms. Not that you have any, mind you. So don't even think about it. He released the man with a gentle shove in the direction of the tavern exit. I just meant she's less likely to kill you. Flirting would just make it worse. <clears throat> I don't have any manly charms. I'll have you know that I was very popular back home. Lucas straightened the wrinkles in his uniform and shook his head with a sigh. <sighs> Fine, but if I die, I'm haunting you. He spun around and, as if he were blasted by a polar vortex, froze. Approaching from directly behind him, face hidden by a black veil decorated with an embossed design of a red party hat, was Miranda. Her arms were folded behind her back, and a wicked smile was carved across her face. I don't believe you were sanctioned the time off needed to attend a fading away party. Miranda inclined her head. Explain yourself. Lucas swallowed hard, looking around for support. As luck would have it, Undine chose that moment to walk through the door behind Miranda. But the warrior Dryad took one look at the scene, gave him a cheeky thumbs up, and swiped a beer off a nearby table before walking right back out. Traitor! It was me, Mom. Atlas raised a hand, earning himself a scornful glare. One of the battle gods tried to drink an entire cask in one go and ended up getting most of it on the floor. I paged janitorial. Tavern cleanup is your job, not his. Miranda's smile stiffened as she stepped around the dryad, waving him off with a flick of her fingers. Return to your assigned duties. Stealing a backward glance to his friend, who nodded in encouragement, Lucas gave the manager a curt bow. The words, Yes, ma'am, fell from his mouth as he spun on his heel and scuttled from the tavern without a second glance. Atlas remained frozen behind the counter for another breath watching the dryad disappear into the hallway before he ducked beneath the counter, hoping Miranda might pass him by and that she hadn't overheard their conversation. 
He purposefully shuffled around the bottles noisily in order to gain a few moments to formulate an exit strategy. He could make a run for it through the crowd, but his gaze slid along the shelf and down to the cast around his leg. The damn thing was supposed to come off a week ago, but he'd left it on as a good excuse to avoid doing any actual work, an act he now cursed himself for. Ahem! The manager's short attempt to grab his attention startled Atlas, and he jumped, slamming his head on the lip of the counter. His fingers wrapped around the nearest bottle, while the other hand massaged the knot now blooming on his skull as he straightened up. He forced a wide smile on his face, and prayed she wouldn't notice the beads of sweat on his forehead as he set the liquor down on the counter before her. Oh, Miss Miranda, <laughs> don't you look festive today. Are you here to see off the good friar? He pulled down an empty wine glass and slid it toward her. Can I offer you some, uh... He glanced at the bottle he had grabbed, and his grin wilted. Pickle juice? Miranda pursed her lips. No, and while I did come here to sign off on Friar Andrew's permanent departure, that is not why I am here, as in here talking to you. She rhythmically tapped her sharpened, blood-red fingernails on the bar, leaving tiny divots with the ferocity of her disdain. You have been personally requested to host an event, and as much as I'd love to decline, the client is highly persistent, and I don't need another visit by lower management. An event? What kind of... At is starting. Is that you? He froze, his words dying, along with his pulse, as he turned to see a full-figured woman parting her way through the bar like it was a catwalk. Her long, banshee black hair fell in a straight curtain down her back, and red painted lips were parted in a genuine smile with tears prickling at her phantom green eyes. He swallowed hard, taking a step back from the counter when she approached. Oh, uh, hi, Mom. Sersha reached over the wooden barricade and pulled her son into a loving embrace. Oh, I've missed you so much. <laughs> when your Uncle Fred called me and told me you were back home, I just couldn't believe it. Shoved against his mother's chest was not something Atlas had ever hoped to experience again, and he wriggled free, sucking down a deep breath. Mom! She tried to pull him back in, and he danced back a step. I'm not home, and why are you here? She placed her hands on her hips and lifted a dark eyebrow. Now you listen here, son. I am your mother, and I will do as I please. If I want to come see you, I will. She sidled into the nearest stool. Although I'm not happy that here is court-ordered community service. I raised you better than that. At the brief flicker of panic on her son's face, Sersha laughed. I thought so. Well, no sense in arguing about the why or the how. You're home, and that's all that matters. The rest of the family will be tickled pink to see you. I'm not, Atlas sighed at his mother's insistence when her words caught him off guard. The rest of the family? Miranda. Reveling in the man's obvious discomfort, let out a slow, sticky laugh. Oh, <laughs> you've been requested to host one of the largest family reunions since the disastrous events of the Greek god Gala back in 49. His gaze whipped from between his mother to the hotel manager and back, a shaky, terrified smile forcing itself onto his lips. A family reunion. You've been listening to Of Risk and Relativity by Leslie Heron, book five in the series here on Tall Tale TV. If you would like to listen to the entire book in one place or any of her other novels, you can find them at talltaletv.com slash series or by following the links in the description. That man's milk will expire before he drinks it. You doing all right there, Andrew? I suppose. Just a little bummed. 
Uh, Gordis has left sock fell behind the dresser. Oh, I see. That's uh, that's quite the talent you have there. Uh, probably great with the ladies. No, not really. I never dated much. <sighs> I'm going to fade away alone. That wasn't a hiccup talking, just a fact. Oh, gotcha. Uh, say, have you met uh, Tortha here? She works in uh, dental acquisition. Hi, handsome. <gasps> the pirates are about to board. Pirates? Uh-oh. Prepare to be boarded. Leave the room and nobody gets hurt. Hey, uh, no, I told you no more booze. He goes. It's the Marines. Scamper, lads. Do what you can on the way out. Wow, that's impressive. I like a man who knows how to warn a girl of danger. <sighs> oh, no. The bar is going to run out of blueberry mead before you ask for more. Not the blueberry mead? Uh, that's okay. I think I'll switch to something else anyway. Oh, I guess... Oh, bother. That one means... Shush now. Uh, how about I guess this one? Um, okay. That one meant there's a friar who's about to get lucky. No, it meant you're going to forget to buy bread next Wednesday. Listen, sugar, I'm pretty sure it meant that broom closet over there is currently unoccupied. If you get my drift... But I... Oh. That's right. Now, come on and let's get out of here so I can... Andrew? A fryer? Oh, dang it. I was this close. I bet he had really nice molars. Good evening, madam. You might understand you wish to be ravished. Oh, my. Bram? No, 